Now this morning we're going to get into the calling uh, of Abraham, the calling of Israel as a nation, the calling of Abraham, what he called them for. We're going to look at its basis and purpose. And here's a here's something that I hope that you'll see. There is a there is at least six at least six purposes for which God called Israel out of the masses of humanity. He gave them distinct purposes. And so what you have to be asking yourself is, has he fulfilled these distinct purposes or has he not fulfilled these distinct purposes and will they be in the future or not? Now, if you haven't looked online, and I don't think that we have this one up yet, I, uh, I sent it to Luke and I don't know if he actually got to it or not, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at their calling both nationally and then we'll look at the basis of it and this should be online later on uh, if it's not on there already right now. So I hope that you'll participate. We're going to get into a doctrine possibly that I'm not really not really thrilled about getting into, but once you cross it, um, doctrines, when you're teaching um, systematically, theologically, you have to address those issues, and that's a, a doctrine that we call divine reprobation. Uh, and so when we get to that, I'll bring that up if we get that far, and we'll talk about that right now. So First of all, we want to talk about God calling Israel out from among the nations unto himself. So Deuteronomy 4, verse 34 and verse 37. Let me just read a couple verses there for you, and then we'll flip over to Deuteronomy 26. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 34. Some of these verses we've read before, so you should be familiar with them. Uh, let me start in verse uh, 33. Ha- has any people heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of fire as you have heard and lived? Or has God tried to go to take for himself a nation from within another nation with trials and signs and wonders, with war, with a mighty hand, and with an outstretched arm, and with great terrors as Yahweh your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? Has that ever happened before, is his question. Has God ever taken out from another nation, a nation unto himself with all the great signs and wonders like he did in the land of Egypt? You remember the plagues that came upon Egypt and how God separated his people and called them unto himself. Has that ever happened to anyone else before? Verse 37, because he loved your fathers, this is the purpose, he loved your fathers Therefore, he chose their seed after them, and he personally brought you from Egypt by his great power. So we see there that God has called Israel out unto himself for himself, and we're going to see for the purposes um, uh, in just a little while here. Chapter 26 and verse 8, chapter 26, Deuteronomy and verse 8, if my glasses are reading correctly here. Uh, the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us. Well, let me, excuse me, that's verse 8 or 6. Uh, here's verse 8. And Yahweh brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror and with signs and wonders. Remember, the Jews, we're told in 1 Corinthians 1, require a sign. The Jews require a sign. And we're, there's a lot more that we could mention in regard to that, but for just keep that in your mind, that God is always dealing with his people according to signs. Now, sometimes when we think about Israel, we think, you know, Israel, they're probably as big as us, or maybe just a little bit smaller, or, uh, you know, they're not probably not that big of a difference between us and them. So notice, if you will, that little red dot up there, you see the very small red dot up there? That little dot is Israel. It's no bigger than the state of New Jersey. All of those green states around Israel are Muslim Islamic nations that have tried to eliminate Israel. Now, why haven't they? How many of you know any Hivites, Jebusites, Hittites, Parasites, Amorites, any of that? No? But yet there are Israelites, and they're still here right? Through all the wars that they've been through, that's the state of Israel and the size of it. 
So God, remember, let me just give you this passage, and you can write it down. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 5, Ezekiel chapter 5 and verse uh, 5. Ezekiel chapter 5, and maybe your translation reads a little bit more clearly, and if you want to read your translation, uh, you can feel free to do that. Ezekiel chapter 5 and verse 5, For thus saith the Lord Yahweh, this is Jerusalem, I have set her, and notice, God says he has set her. Are you, are you following along with me? For thus saith the Lord Yahweh, this is Jerusalem. I have set her at the center of the nations with all the lands around her. God has put Israel as the center stage of American history. Have you ever thought about that? America is not the center stage of American history. I love this nation, wouldn't want to live anywhere else. But God has set Israel as the focal point of history, right? Uh, look at Amos chapter 3. Again, we are familiar with the book of Amos. Amos chapter 3, just to show you again the national distinction here. Amos chapter 3, and we'll read verses uh, 1 through 3. Amos chapter 3. get there before me just tell me and you can read it anybody there right now read that for me zach real good and loud would you uh hang on just a minute brandon do we have the mics okay shortly i forgot about that go ahead try to read good and loud for us zach God said, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you with a greater chastisement. What does he mean by that? You only have I known of all the families of the earth. He means that there's a special relationship between him and his covenant people, Israel. He had called them to be a specific people. Not only did he just call them out, but he's going to go back to this kingdom language again. In Exodus, if you want to look there, Exodus chapter 19, and again, we'll have these outlines up so you can look at them later. But Exodus chapter 19 and verse 4, let me read 1 through 4. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on this day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. Then they set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped. In the front of the mountain, now Moses went up to God, and Yahweh called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I lifted you up on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. So now then, if you will, notice the conditional language, if you then will listen to my voice and keep my covenant, Again, this is the Abrahamic covenant. Then you shall, or the Mosaic covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples of the earth, uh, among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests. So again, God calls them out, calls them unto himself to be a kingdom people for himself. And this is, and we're going to see the purpose for which he calls them out uh, unto himself, right? To be a malacha, a kingdom unto himself. So what is the, ba- the basis for which God calls them out? Well, we've read it before, but let me just give you just one passage, and there's many that we can look at, but since I'm close to it, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 4 through 7, Deuteronomy chapter 9, uh, Verses 4 through 7. Let me just read that very quickly for you. Do not say in your heart when Yahweh your God has driven them out before you, saying, because of my righteousness, Yahweh has brought me into this land. Remember, they're outside of the land of Egypt. God is bringing them into, uh, out, they're outside the land of Canaan. God is going to bring them into the land of Canaan. 
Now they're bring, he's bringing them in, and they're saying it's because we're so righteous, it's because we're so good that God's doing this thing. That's why uh, we're, you know, we're God's elect. Verse 4, he has brought me into the land in, to possess this land, but it is because of the wickedness of these nations that Yahweh is disposing them before you. It is not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart that you're going to possess the land, but it is because of the wickedness of these nations that Yahweh your God is disposing them before you in order to confirm the oath which Yahweh swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's that covenant language again. So you shall know it is not because of your righteousness. See, again, he's mentioning that over and over and over again. It's not because of your righteousness. It's not because you're such good people. It's because the other people are so wicked. So you shall know that it is not because of your righteousness that Yahweh, your God, is giving you this good land to possess. For you are a stiff-necked people. Again, God is telling them that he is bringing them in to cast out the rebels and to replace the rebels. So God brings them in due to his grace and his mercy, right? Now, when we talk about calling, there's obviously, again, a lot of times when we think about um, the term calling, we think, well, we're talking about calling to salvation, and that's all that we're thinking about here. But actually, there are several different ways that you can use this term. And this gets into soteriology and the study of the doctrine of salvation and things of, of that sort. But what we have is an external call and an internal call. An external call that goes out to all, everybody who goes to church or that hears a TV program to where they give the gospel, they hear this external call, this gospel call to repent and receive Christ. And then there's this internal call in which our eyes are opened and we see the truth and we repent and trust Christ. So if you're familiar with it, look at the book of Nehemiah. Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Kings, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And we're looking at Nehemiah chapter 9, Nehemiah chapter 9, and then we'll flip over after Nehemiah 9, and we'll look at 2nd Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 after that. 2nd Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 after that. So Nehemiah chapter 9, and then we'll look at sec, uh, a passage in 2nd Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse 5, I believe it is. 2 Peter 2 and verse 5. So Nehemiah chapter 9, and let's look at verses 20 and then verse 30 as well. Verse 20, and you gave your good spirit to give them insight, your manna you did not withhold from their mouth, and you gave them water for their thirst. You see that? You gave them your good spirit to give them insight. Remember, the Holy Spirit is the one who illuminates our mind, 1 Corinthians 2 talks about. Now, notice verse 30. It's a very important verse here. This is the external call, the external or universal call. Now, notice what he says there in verse 30. However, you bore with them for many years and testified to them by your spirit, by the hand of your prophets, yet they would not give ear so you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the land. Do you notice that? He gave them his spirit to testify to them, and they would not hear. It's kind of like what uh, uh, Stephen said, when you stop up your ears and you won't hear the Holy Spirit speaking. Second Peter chapter 2 then, and verse 5, and notice what he says here. You did not spare the ancient world, but preserve Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So there's a distinction there, the world of the ungodly. Uh, someone told me this morning that uh, MacArthur had said in uh, the Shepherds Conference that they had just passed that it was more likely that it was between 700,000 and 2 million people that were killed in the flood. Still, that is an enormous amount of people uh, to kill and only uh, allow eight to survive. You see that? But Noah is filled with the Spirit, and he gives that external call for 120 years. 
I think it's 1 Peter chapter 3 that talks about that. If you want to look that up, you can look it up and just raise your hand if you do find that. I think it's around verses 19 and 20, somewhere around in there. But I'm not, I'm not positive that's uh, the reference there. But for 120 years, God is calling them, right? Now, there's also an internal call, an internal call. I'll just give you a, several passages. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2 is a good verse to think about when we're talking about this internal call. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, of course there's multitude of verses that we could look at and I'm not going to take the time to do that. I'll let the pastors do that. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints. Here's a internal call. God is internally calling you, internally quickening you to see the truth, to repent and trust Christ. Uh, Philippians is pretty close, so turn over to Philippians. Let me give you just a few verses to think about, maybe in books that I'm not uh, usually opening. Uh, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And notice verse... uh, well, that's not the one I want. Let me try ten. Let me try John ten. That's an easy one to remember. John chapter ten, and verse twenty-seven. I believe it is. Yeah, yeah. This is a very good uh, reference point. Jesus is speaking, and he says, "My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me." Right. And of course, you can go to the Ordo Salutis, the Romans uh, chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, and other passages. But there's an internal call that all of us receive when we come to faith in Christ. Yeah, Carrie, do Brandon, we, uh, yeah, just hang on one second there, Carrie. And any hard questions, let me just say this first. We'll go to the pastors afterward, all right? So. Go ahead, Kerry. Second uh, Peter chapter two, uh, talking about false prophets will come, and it said uh, verse four: For if God spared not the angels of sin, but cast them down to hell, delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved to judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and then also chapter three. Uh, Verse 5, for they are willingly ignorant that the word of God of heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water, everyone perished. Does it give the 120-year reference in there? Uh, further down, it talks about one day shall be as a thousand years. Actually, I was looking, there's a, there's a reference to that 120-year. If you see that one, uh, point, point that out to us there. Then there's also, again, a, a vocational call. Now, again, this is just to a position, and I just want to give you several, several um, thoughts to consider so that we can get on to where we're going. God had called prophets. God had called priests. God had called kings. God had called the apostles. God has called national leaders today, and yet not all of them are saved. God sets them there. Every leader has been ordained and set in their position by God, but that does not mean that God has called all of them to be saved, right? Let me just give you an external reference to that so that you're familiar, and I know that you know this, so I'll just read just a couple of the passages in there. But Romans chapter 13, and I don't know that we're going to get as far as I wanted to, but Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist have been appointed by God. So every authority, your parents, your teachers, the law enforcement, government officials, everyone who is over you has been placed over you by God. So if you rebel against your parents, Elena, you are rebelling against God because God has put your parents over you. To look out for your soul. Amen? All right. Thank you for saying amen to that. I was worried. No, I'm just kidding. She's a, 
She's an excellent girl. All right. First Corinthians or First Samuel chapter 13. Let me give you just a couple of references to this external call. First Samuel chapter 13, verse 14 says, But now your kingdom shall not endure. Yahweh has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and Yahweh has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not kept what Yahweh commanded you. That's 1 Samuel chapter 13. And then flip over to chapter 15. This is concerning Saul and his disobedience. He was the first king of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 15, notice verse 11. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not established my words. And Samuel became angry and cried out to Yahweh all night. Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of divination or witchcraft, and insubordination is as wickedness and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of Yahweh, he has also rejected you from being king. So here Saul has been rejected. God called him. God placed him as the leader. But now it comes to a place where Saul's wanting to do his own thing. He's not wanting to follow the word of Yahweh. And Yahweh says, enough is enough. You've now crossed the line. My kingdom now is going to go to a man who is after my own heart. You have been removed. That's very sad, and that's going to sort of flow into the thought that we're thinking here in a little bit. Let me give you a passage in 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 14. We're thinking about the kings. Remember, there's multitudes of kings, but if you look at 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 8 through 10, notice what it says in 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 8 through 10. And he tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. Yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and who walked after me with all his heart to do only that which was right in my sight. You also have done more evil than all who were before you. And you have gone and made for yourself other gods and molded images to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, because of this, Behold, I am bringing evil on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam every male person, both bond and free in Israel, and make a clean sweep of the house of Jeroboam as one sweeps away the dung until it is gone. God said, I am going to wipe away every king from the northern kingdom because they are all wicked, even though God is the one who had set them in that position. Now you say, well, that was just kings. Well, let me give you a New Testament passage. And uh, again, if you want to comment or sort of get involved here, just feel free to put up your hand and we'll try to mic you here. But let me give you a passage in in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 6 and verse 70. Look at that passage. Many of you probably are very familiar with this. John chapter 6. And notice then verse 70. This is Jesus answering here. And Jesus answering, says this in verse 70, Jesus answered them, did I myself not choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is what? A devil. Here is God having chosen the 12 unto himself, and yet one of the ones that he chose was a very devil, the very devil himself, was Judas who betrayed him. So there are various calls in the scripture. Do you see that? There are external calls. There are internal calls. There are vocational calls. And God has called you to positions. First of all, he's called you unto himself to be his child. He's called you into the area where you work to be an influence for him there. But God has called you uh, to where you're at. So be satisfied where you're at and bloom there where you're at, right? So my question, though, is, Why Israel? I mean, of all the people who are left, of all the people who are left, why choose Israel? What makes Israel so good? Why why would he choose them as he did in Exodus chapter 19? What does the scripture teach about that? So let me give you some examples. And of course, this will be on our, our outline once we get that up online. 
First of all, if you look back at uh, Genesis chapter 12, you see this promise that God gives to Abraham. It's, um, this is before the covenant, before he makes the covenant with him. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, let me read that for you, if I can. And Yahweh said to Abraham, go forth from your land, from your kin, from your father's house, the land I will show you, I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, I'll make your name great, so, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God first has called Israel unto himself to be a blessing to you and I, the Gentiles, right? Do, do you realize this? I'm not sure if maybe, maybe you don't realize this, but I think it's in Deuteronomy 7, and hopefully I'm, I'm correct here. I'm, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, um, and maybe somebody can look for that while, we're, while we continue to talk here. Uh, yeah, let, let me read, I think, verse, maybe verse 1 here has it. And when Yahweh your God brings you into the land where you're entering to possess it, and he clears, this is God will clear, God will clear away many nations before you, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and stronger than you. Those are Gentiles. The Gentiles were to be eliminated. You're a Gentile. You are not in the official plan of God, so to speak, directly. God directly was choosing his people. Um, Acts chapter 3 and verse 25. Let me read for you that one as well. The, the book of Acts chapter 3. verse 20. And there are many passages here, but I just tried to pull out a couple from various places. But Acts chapter 3 and verse 25. Acts 3, 25. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in you, your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In you, through you, through your families, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. You see that? So God has called Israel. He's not called America. He's not called uh, the Soviet Union. He's not called Greece, Medo-Persia, Rome. He's called Israel to use Israel to be a blessing to you and I, to all nations. You see that? Now, did he get tired of them? And did he just do away with them? And are they done? Or is there still a future for them? Right? And so that's kind of what we're looking at today. You can see this coming through, and this was mentioned before, but let me turn there and I'll show you just a couple things. Maybe it'll get your mind going to where you want to ask some questions. But in Galatians chapter 3, Again, the promise is made over and over again to Abraham. There's the word promise over and over. If you read your Bible, you can see it in the, the book of Galatians um, over and over in various verses, verse 17, verse 18 and following, verse 19, over and over again. There's the promise made to Abraham, the promise made to Abraham over and over again. And he says in chapter 3 and uh, verse 8 there, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by, here's Gentiles now. We're going way ahead of Israel. The scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith proclaimed the gospel before to Abraham, the gospel meaning the good news, saying, in you, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. All the nations will be blessed in you. Verse 16 says this, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as in plural, though the reference is singular, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ or the Messiah. Now, what was the promise? Look at verse 14. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's the new covenant promise, the new covenant promise. Remember, Abraham was given various promises, land, seed, and we'll get into this as we go, land, seed, and blessing. 
The land is promised in Deuteronomy 29 and 30. We'll look at that. The Davidic promise in uh, Psalm 89, First Chronicles, uh, the New Covenant promise in Jeremiah 31 and various other places. But down at the very bottom there, you'll see another covenant promise, the unconditional covenant with a uh, conditional blessing you find in Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26, and that is the Mosaic covenant. Anytime the Old Testament prophets come and they're exhorting Israel, keep the covenant, keep the covenant, keep the covenant, it is only, there's only one conditional covenant they could keep. And we'll see this when we get into the covenants because the Abrahamic covenant was based on promise. God said, I'm going to promise to do this, to give you the land, the seed, and the blessing. I, God, will do this. But when you get down to the Mosaic covenant, God says, you're going to have to fulfill this covenant in order to enjoy the land, right? And, of course, we'll get to that, and we'll get to what all that involves. Now, some people, uh, and I know this is sometimes difficult for some people to understand, so let me just give you this, and maybe it'll help you. I've given it to you before. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you've not saw it before. And maybe you don't agree with it, and that's fine. And if you don't, just help, help everybody to understand sort of maybe you're thinking about it. But the basis of salvation in every age is the death of Christ. Amen? Nobody gets to heaven apart from the death of Christ. He lived a perfect life. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, Hebrews 7.26. The basis of, of salvation in every age is the death of Christ. The requirement for salvation in every age is faith. You have to believe. You don't just get in apart from your unbelief. You must believe, right? The object of that faith in every age is God. You must believe what God says. You must trust what God says, the word of Yahweh. Remember, the kings were dismissed, and Samuel was dismissed, and everyone was dismissed who would not trust in the word of Yahweh. You must trust in what God says. The content of the faith changes in the various dispensations or periods of times or, 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 or koinomia, the various uh, administrations, right? It is the last point of the course that distinguishes dispensationalism from covenant theology. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking, and some of you might be thinking, well, everybody in the Old Testament, they all had faith in the, the physical life, death, and burial uh, of Jesus, and that's how they got saved. Well, again, the basis of that salvation was the work of Christ. Look at some of these passages. So having overlooked the times of ignorance, God has now proclaimed to mankind that all people everywhere are to repent. There was a time in which they didn't get it. There was a time in which they did not get it. Listen to 1 Peter. Peter says, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. They were trying to figure that out. Now you say, well, that was, you know, other people, but of course the disciples and people closest to him, and especially up to his resurrection, they all got the gospel, they all understood the gospel. There was no question in their mind. Well, then help me to understand this passage. This is in the Gospel of Mark. For he was teaching his disciples, this is Jesus, teaching his disciples, telling them the Son of Man is to be handed over to men, and they will kill him, and when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. Isn't that the gospel? Yes or no? That's the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, right? But they did not understand that statement, and they were afraid to ask him. They didn't get the gospel. Because it had not been revealed to them. You see what I'm saying? Now, any, any thoughts or questions on that so far? Because this seems to be the thrust here. And again, we're not making light of the work of Christ. He lived a perfect life. He died a substitutionary death. God vindicated that perfect life by raising him out from the dead. And whosoever receives him has eternal life. We don't make light of that. That's, that's a given. But that does not mean that everybody in the Old Testament understood the gospel the way you and I understand the gospel. Carrie? Uh, that was one thing we were going, going over with junior church, too. 
uh, the, the Pharisees and religious leaders had the Old Testament to, uh, as their upbringing and what they studied in their seminaries and whatnot. And when Christ came, he said, you've heard or you've read all these things that you've understood in the past, but I'm here to tell you this is what it really means. And, you know, they were, they had their old school thinking of how they were brought up. And then here comes Christ, some guy claiming to be God and seemingly going against what they understood in the Old Testament, you know, that the name of God is to be revered. And then here comes some man saying he's God. You know, it's, they, it just it mixed everything up and they didn't understand. So let me ask you a question then. The covenant that, that Jesus told the people, you are to be obeying, what covenant was that? It had to be the Mosaic. It was the only one that had conditions. There are no conditions for the Abrahamic covenant, which carries with it the land, the seed, and the blessing. It had to be the Mosaic covenant. Brandon, do you? We're going to give Brandon a run for his money this morning. Right? Again, all, I, the, all I'm trying to get you to do is think here. Okay? I'm not trying to convert your understanding. I'm just trying to get you to think how the Bible lays things out, Dave. So, again, in any, if you ask a question, I don't know what the elders are I, here. So I, I understand. <laughs> You're an elder, right? I was. <laughs> I just wanted to put that in there. <laughs> no, just to clarify, the in the Old Testament, for example, uh, in the times of the wilderness, when the Jews were in the wilderness, what they had to do in order to be saved was to believe that the sacrificial system that was given to them and, and um, um, their their adherence to that was how they were saved. No, not their adherence, not their obedience to that, but their, their trusting that God was providing a provision in the sacrificial system was how they were saved. They weren't believing in anything beyond that, right? You're asking me if I know what they believe? Well, what was, what was required in that time, during that time in the wilderness, what was required for one of them to be, because they were all chosen, but they weren't all saved. So in order to be saved, what did they have to believe? They had to believe in what God told them to believe in. Which was, at that time? Whatever he told them to believe in. To go through the sacrifices, right? To trust in the promised seed that was to come. That had been narrowed down, you know, Genesis 3.15, the king will come from the line of Judah, uh, Genesis 49.10. But remember now, they had these passages, and they're clearly laid out in the Old Testament, but they didn't get them because their, their minds were not illuminated to that truth. The passages were there, but they didn't get them. Even the disciples didn't get them, right? Yeah. I was just going to say, this I is think, the pastor, by the way. So if he, I, I'm one of the elders here. Uh, I think um, I, I think a, a good way to look at it is this. So, so like in the Old Testament, all right, that people were saved by faith in Christ. Now, how much of Christ did they know? Because I, I think did the Ryrie quote that you just had on there did that say faith in God? I, I do. Yeah. Yes. Now, now, a lot of people say, well, they just had to have faith in the Father. Well, th there's truth in that. You have to have faith in the Father, but you've got to have faith in whatever the Father has revealed to you. Yes. And so here's the thing. From, from the garden, you know what I mean, from the time of the fall, they, they were told there's this seed coming. Yes. So they had to have faith in this coming seed. Did they know his name was going to be Jesus? Did they know that he was going to do some of the things he was going to do? No, but they knew there was going to be an offspring, a Savior that God would send. And God kind of reveals more and more of that as you go throughout history. And so you got to look at it like this. It's always faith in Christ. It's always faith in the Messiah that saves you. Yes. All right. It's not just faith in, in a God or even, even just God the Father. It's faith in what the God the Father has told you about, I think, the Messiah and faith in him too, of course. Yes. But you, if you look at it this way, I mean, think of people in the Old Testament. In Genesis, they're looking at Jesus. They're looking in faith at Jesus. But it's through a, a, a window that's really dirty. Yes. Right, as time goes on, that window just kind of gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And now what's required in order to look on faith you know, at, at Jesus is a whole lot more than what was required of them. And so uh, it's always faith in Jesus. But I think we've got to be careful with that. That's one of the things that at times scares me a little bit about some dispensationalists uh, is that I, I think 
they they mix up what the object of the faith is. You yeah. know what I mean? So And that's what we're talking about. The, the work of Christ, Romans three, twenty five and twenty six, Romans nine, fourteen and fifteen, it's all the work of Christ. But again, the Holy Spirit must illuminate your mind to this. We believe in the doctrine of regeneration. That regeneration precedes repentance and faith. So if God, the Holy Spirit, does not regenerate your mind, open your eyes to see, you can't see. Right or wrong? So you have to have that regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you want to go so far as to say, did the Holy Spirit regenerate them in the Old Testament? Now you're getting into the new covenant. You see that? So then you have another problem. So you have to think about what you're reading and what that means and how you take that. Yes, they had faith in what they understood God to be declaring to them. But back then, they knew nothing about Yeshua. They knew nothing about him being God incarnate. They only relied upon what God had told them. And what God had told them was revealed in the Mosaic Covenant. You get that? Are you with me so far? How many are in disagreement? Just raise your hand and tell me why. We'll try to help you along. Yes, can you, can you wait just a second? We're going to have Brandon come up so we can get everybody. Again, what we're talking about is how the first thing that God does is God calls the nation of Israel to be a blessing unto the whole world, a blessing that will ultimately bring the new heavens and the new earth, and you and I into that new heavens and new earth. Amen? All right. No, I think I would add to that, not disagreeing per se, but... but when, he, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he tells him he must be born again, and he seems totally lost by that. Jesus doesn't say, well, you just don't get it yet. I haven't explained it. He goes, you're the teacher of Israel. You don't know this. You should know this. It's in, it was in the Old Testament yeah, there. Yeah, I, I think he did you know it. Yeah, so, so there were, it's very, I agree, they had it much tougher. We have it very easy, and I think we're going to be judged greater. Yes. But but, uh, but it was there in the Old Testament, not clearly, it's very, very much more difficult. But what, think of what would have, think about the disciples and when God opened their eyes and regenerated their hearts to those Old Testament texts. I mean, it would have been a flood of information that just hit them all at one time, right? I mean, they were probably shouting, running in circles and everything else when they got it. Because all of those Old Testament texts would have really come to light at that time. I was just going to say, you know, we're, we're speaking about regeneration. I mean, that's something, that's a question, like regeneration and faith. How did saints in the Old Testament receive faith? Was it in the exact same way that we do? Is there, is there a way to separate the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and regeneration? I, I think there, in my own personal opinion, I think there has to be. But you think about where was the Spirit of God in the Old Testament? Where did the Spirit of God dwell in the Old Testament? This is an important question to answer in regards to all this, but where did he dwell? In the tabernacle and then in the, in the temple. Now, now, where does the Spirit of God dwell now in the New Covenant? You know what I mean? In believers, in the church. And so we are the temple. And so I think there has to be, and Andrew and I have went back and forth and we've discussed this, and this is something we even wrestle over. So this is difficult stuff, you guys. This is not like, hey, you know, everyone should know this. It's easy. Uh, I, I do think you have to separate the indwelling of the Holy Spirit with regeneration. You know what I mean? The granting of, of faith and, and life um, for saints in the Old Testament. So if, you don't, if you're not getting what the pastor's saying here. Yeah, help, help me out, brother. There, just very simply put, there are two viewpoints. Some people hold the viewpoint that the Old Testament saints had to have been regenerated to some extent in order to see and believe in Christ. Now, how does that affect the new covenant? Others say, no, it couldn't have been because the new covenant was still yet future. And so in the Old Testament, they, where they were illuminated to certain truths, but the, the truths they were illuminated to were not the truths we are illuminated to. So there's two, two distinctions there. Some believe the Old Testament saints were regenerated. Some believe that the New Testament saints, beginning at Pentecost, which I believe is at uh, Acts chapter 2, that the New Testament saints were regenerated there. And everybody before that could not see clearly. And that's why I put up the text in uh, Mark chapter 9 when Jesus tells them the gospel and they, it doesn't click. They don't get it. They don't get it. See that? 
So that's, a, that's something that many people struggle with, okay? So if you don't struggle with it, don't worry about it. If you're like, uh, I don't struggle with it, but I mean, if you struggle with it, you struggle with it, right? So there, there are multiple views there. Anybody else? That's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. All right, let me finish this uh, next one, and then maybe we'll, maybe we'll get a little bit further than that. Uh, the next one is to, of course, bring unto himself a covenant nation. This is the second reason. It'll be point B on your outline. God brings them into the, the conditional mosaic or what we would call suzerain covenant. Where uh, suzerain covenant is you have a head and a vassal. You have somebody who is, if you have an apartment, I used to have an apartment a long, long time ago. You had the person who was in charge, and you had the person who uh, was not in charge, who paid dues and received benefits and blessings or received the cursings. That's a suzerain covenant, right? Uh, I was going to show you that last week, but our time ran out and we didn't do that. But what I want you to see here is that God, out of all the peoples of the earth, had called Israel out to be this vassal regent state for himself that was going to represent him and take the truth of who he was to all the world. And that'll, that'll bring us into uh, the next point. And let me, try to, let me try to do it real quick here. Uh, let me give you just several verses to think about. And here's the third one, and we'll close with this one. They were the recipient of God's revelation. Not America, not New England. It was Israel who were the recipients of God's revelation. Let me give you just a couple of verses real quick. Deuteronomy, and we'll finish with this. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, says this. See, I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as Yahweh my God commanded me, that you should do this in the land where you're entering to possess it. You shall keep and do them, for that is your wisdom, your understanding, and the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as Yahweh our God whenever he called on him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you. You have a, the law from the one true living God who has revealed it unto you. You have the truth. It's not in philosophy. It's not in tradition. It's not in some sort of religious uh, ethics. It is in sola scriptura. It is scripture alone, right? And that's what people are always judged for. Let me give you just a couple of other verses. And I know I've mentioned this verse before, but it's so important if you've never been here to know this verse, Psalm 147, I believe it is, Psalm 147, verses 19 and 20, and we'll finish up with just a couple verses here, Psalm 147, verses 19 and 20, <clears throat> he says this, who declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and judgments to Israel, he has not done so with any nation, so far for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise Yah. God revealed his word to Israel alone. You can read it in Paul's writing in Romans chapter 3. Let me give you a couple of verses here and we'll, we'll finish with this. Romans chapter 3, uh, verse, I think it is 2, if I can find it here. Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and then 9, 4. What advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God, with the commandments of God. God had given them his commandments. Chapter 9, then, and verse 4, and we'll close with this passage here. Romans chapter 9, and verse 4. And he says this, who are Israelites to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the, temp and, the, and the temple service and the promises. God had entrusted the Jewish people with the only truth that there is. He entrusted the Jewish people with the only truth 
that we're is. And by his grace, we not only have that, but we understand it. Amen? We understand it. All right. Any closing thoughts uh, or comments there? Yeah, DeShannon. Hang on just one second right there. So if you go on down to verse 6, then, and it says, but it is, no. Um, I'm not sure what chapter you're in. Romans 9. Romans 9? Mm-hmm. Where it says that not all, yeah, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. What does that mean? Not all the Jews are like we put up there. Not all who are within the nation of Israel are the true Israel, are the remnant, are the saved. Remember, they were, there are many that were chosen, kings, prophets, disciples, apostles, right? But they weren't all the remnant. They weren't all the saved portion. Remember, only those who were obedient to what God had revealed to them were allowed to be brought in. You have to wait. Come on, Brandon. So I, think I think next week he's going to let the girls pass the mic. <laughs> that's where I think I, in my mind, get confused a little bit as I go through some of this is figuring out when are, when are we talking about the saved Israel, the remnant, and when are we talking about Israel as a whole nation? when it comes to the promise of inheritance and blessing and seed. Yeah, well, that, that requires a lot of digging on the part of your leaders. I mean, true, truthfully, it, it requires you getting into the text and wrestling with the text.